All right, good to be with you. If we haven't met, I'm Chip Freed, the lead teaching pastor here at Garfield Memorial Church for worshiping with us online. We're glad to have you with us. Maybe throw in a chat, even if you're on YouTube or our, our church website, there's ways to do that. Or just email uh, Kurt, C-U-R-T, at garfieldchurch.org, our online pastor. Uh, we'd like to connect with you beyond worship. We're beginning a new teaching series today. Um, it's new to you, some of you. It's not new to our leadership teams here at Garfield Memorial Church because it was something God pressed on my heart clear back in January. Um, and the theme is from surviving to thriving. Now, when I talk about thriving, I'm not talking about thriving financially or materialistically or all those things. I'm talking about thriving spiritually. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches, right? He gave us that image of life coming into us and, and that we're living beings um, and that we should be thriving. We should be growing more and more into the likeness of Christ. That's been really difficult the last four years um, since all hell broke loose on March 15, 2020. That was the D-Day when none of you were here and all of, a few of us were here you know, preaching to a camera for years and years. And then all hell broke loose in every corner of the universe, right? Shared before, Rich Viotis, a friend through Mosaics and Queens said, we got nailed by CPR, COVID, politics, and race. And it just came in and took no prisoners and ran right over the, the, the uh, American church in ways we weren't prepared for. Um, and, and so the bottom line, you know, even during all that time when I was still helping lead conferences nationally and we'd go out there and and people would come in online because we couldn't be in person, or then they could start showing up in person again. And they kept saying to us, you know, hey, what's going to happen? What, what's the next turn? And we're like, anybody that answers that question is trying to sell you something. None of us know, right? When I looked at the Spanish flu when it first hit our nation years and years ago, at the very beginning of the 20th century, I was studying what happened after that. And it said that the New York city uh, public transportation did not return to those, their previous, you know, vitality and population for seven years. And I thought, wow, public transportation in New York, everybody thinks they need that. Not everybody thinks they need church. Now they don't even need blooming onions. You know, Outback is closing 41 stores. I mean, it's a different world. We're being disrupted. And we were so disrupted, and I was asked to be part of a webinar by Barna. Barna's an amazing research group in our country. They study faith trends. They study, um, you know, sociological trends. They study pastors. They study faith leaders and trying to understand um, what's going on in, in the world. Um, and they, they did a new study of pastors in 2023, how they were doing mentally, emotionally, it was ugly, man. I mean, they asked me to do a little piece in it, and we were on that webinar for three hours, and we realized how disruptive these years have been. Disruptive for us as a church community, disruptive for all of you individually, and for some of you professionally and beyond, right? And David Kinnaman, the president of Barna, when he was in that seminar, he finally said something that I go, that's it. And he basically said, you know, what, what all these things did, they didn't bring a whole lot of new challenges. They just accelerated what was already happening. Good, bad, and ugly, right? I think those years brought out the best in some of us and brought out the worst in some of us. And, and uh, he said in the American church, we were caught unaware. He said in the American church, we were all skinny dipping. And then the tide went out. And I said, yeah, that, that's it. And they had a scripture for the pastors that were coming in there, and they looked at the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> and I'm preaching about Moses today before we come to the communion table. But I think there's something very similar with Paul and with Moses as they shared a common calling, and it was that calling that rescued them. That calling was their foundation. It was their firm ground that they could always run back to. They got confused along the way. But they had a, a, a scripture from 2 Corinthians. Now, I want to note to you, if you ever read, I mean, it's a little personal Bible reading, read 1 Corinthians in its entirety, then stop, then go read 2 Corinthians in its entirety, 
And you, if you really look at that, you'll go, I don't know if this is the same guy that wrote the second letter. Because in first, and it is, but New Testament scholar N.T. Wright and others say something's happened to Paul along the way. There's a lot of speculation what it was. He went through a lot of persecution. He was betrayed, you know, by friends just like Jesus was. I mean, um, his life threatened. But the Paul that writes 1 Corinthians, man, he's preaching on love and grace of Jesus love. And he's, he's encouraging people and he's challenging others. He said, quit thinking you're more spiritual than your brother and sister. We're all part of the same body. And this is a, this is a church building, church encouraging Paul. He gets to 2 Corinthians. He is beat up. And I really related to him last year because I, I told some of my closest friends, at the end of last year, after four years of this stuff, you know, I was either resign or get off the mat and start whipping the devil's butt. It was one of the two. And I chose the latter. I don't know how I'm doing, but I'm doing better. How about you? And, and I sense the tide shifting. But here's what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, right? This is not the optimistic Paul. This was the head of our, our, this was our theme scripture for the day. Isn't this encouraging? I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I don't feel weak. This is Paul. Who is led into sin? And I don't inwardly burn. And it was like, you know, th this, has been, this has been the church across the world, you know, the last several years. It's been like we do a lot of innovative things, but the bottom line is, man, I'm just trying to survive, you know. And, and some of you have had that in your personal life. We've had it collectively. But I was really interested because this scripture hit home to me, but I, I said, you know, but it's time to turn the page. And, and if you turn the page... Paul is, he is miserable for 11 chapters of 2 Corinthians. But if you go two more chapters when he closes his letter, hope and faith jump back on him. Because he says after this misery, he says, I heard Jesus say to me, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness, even your weakness. So Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. And he closes this letter with these words. And I want these words to be words to us for the next nine or ten weeks as we go through this survey. Examine yourselves. This is a time of self-examination, right? Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves, and I want this to ring in our ears. I'm going to read it at the start of this series. I'm going to read it at the end. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? He's not out there somewhere. That's what Moses thought on the backside of the desert. He's with you. He's in you. He's for you, Paul would say. And if God be for you, who can be against you? So in 2024, uh, I was telling our leaders, we got to focus on going from surviving to thriving. And I told them, it feels like the dust is finally settling. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Blue skies, green trees, right? It feels like the dust is settling. We know what's happened. We know the disruption in our personal lives. At Garfield Memorial, we know the disruption here. We know who's gone. We know who's come in the past few years. We know our resources. And it's time for us to begin to say, okay, we were surviving. Let's go to thriving because the dust has settled. Now, that picture is a lie, right? Here's what it really looks like, doesn't it? Yeah, that's, that's it. That's what I told him. I said, if, you know, I'm trying to preach this to you. And it feels like this, like Dorothy's family coming up out of the cellar after the tornadoes, right? But I, I came across this little slogan. This was a Christian song I'd never heard of. And they have one that calls, when the dust settles, we win. I, was, I said, that's theologically correct, right? If you read the Bible, there's a lot of difficult suffering things. Even Revelation said, there's going to be tribulations and other things. But when it's all over, we win. Um, 
I, I checked out that song because I thought Leah could sing it. It is a horrible song. It is terrible. It's like bad country and grunge and punk rock put together. But it's a heck of a theological statement. So don't listen to the song. Listen to the slogan. When the dust settles, we win. Going from surviving to thriving. And we're going to look today at Moses under the theme of listen for God's call. That's the first thing we have to do in this move. Individually in our own faith journey um, and also collectively as a church, ground ourselves in God's call. Because we have what Caleb and Leilani read for us, really the most famous call story in the Bible. The story of the burning bush, right? You, you ever heard out there in secular culture or just general nomenclature, there are biblical references made by people who don't know the Bible, aren't people of faith, right? The NCAA tournament, you always have a David versus Goliath matchup, right? Uh, in business, when there's a, a business that's almost going out, but then they come bounce back, they call it a Lazarus experience. And how many times do you hear people say, you know, hey, what's going on in your life? Well, I haven't had any burning bushes, right? It's out there because this, this statement, it, this call story is so famous. And here is Moses answering his call. Now, I know what you want to say to me. It's like, Chip, okay, okay, so going from surviving to thriving, this is Moses. You know, like, there's movies about him, you know, from a lot of movies about him. And, you know, he, like, was up there when God literally wrote, you know, the Ten Commandments. You know, he parted the Red Sea. This is Moses. Well, I just want to get a good picture we have the burning bush story. You heard it. Moses saw burn, a bush that did, wasn't consumed. He turned. He looked aside. When God saw it, he looked aside. He called to him out of the bush. Moses, the angel of the Lord did, was speaking to him. Moses, uh, take off your sandals, your shoes. You're on holy ground. I'm going to send you to Pharaoh. I've heard the misery of my people. You're going to leave them out of bondage. Amazing calling, right? Amazing leader. Look how he responds. But Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I have never been eloquent. Neither in the past nor even now that you've spoken to your servant. I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. This is at the burning bush. This is in the presence of the living God. Hey, I can't speak. And then the Lord said to him, who gives speech to mortals? <laughs> who enabled you to talk? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. And Moses said the eternal words of faith, oh my Lord, please send someone else. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, what of your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak fluently. Even now he's coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth for you. And you shall serve as God for him. Take in your hand this staff that I'm giving you with which you will perform signs. This is a case study of someone that went from surviving to thriving. In fact, he, the end of Moses' story is amazing. Do you want to see his epitaph? It, it, tell me if you would like this one on your tombstone. If you all are around to say goodbye to your pastor someday, would you talk to Terry and say, I, I'd like this one on my tombstone. Just change Moses to Chip, right? This would be a great tombstone. Moses was 120 years old when he died. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor had not abated. I can say something about that with the, some of the commercials on TV, but I'll leave that alone. I want to make sure my wife lets me home. His sight was unimpaired, and his vigor was unabated. 120 years old. Never since has there arisen a prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. How did he get here from, oh God, send somebody else to one who could keep vision all his life, who could keep vigor even through many trails? And he's going to go through some more bad trials if you keep reading Exodus. At one point, he's so fed up with the people, he goes back up in the mountain with God, and he doesn't send, say send somebody else. He said, God, could you just kill me now? You know. But yet, here's where he gets to. He gets into this position. What was it? that helped Moses get there. First off, this 
picture of God's power at the bush and Moses' human frailty shows us that the secret ingredient is not us. It's the power of God, Paul learned, made perfect in our weakness. There was a woman I read about uh, years ago, and there was a wonderful documentary about her. Her name, her name was Gladys Aylward, and uh, she, there was a documentary. You can Google it. Think back in 2010, 2011, and it, it, the documentary is titled The Small Woman with a Great God. Gladys was like five foot one, you know, a buck nothing soaking wet. And she went back way long time ago to be a missionary to China. She felt God calling her, and she got in there when there was great turmoil and warfare, and she started an orphanage, and the Japanese army was coming in, and she had to save her kids. It was going to be like a Rwanda event. So this five foot one, a buck nothing woman, led a hundred orphans to safety over some of the most rugged mountains in all of China with nothing but the shoes on their feet. And she told the, the writers of her story later that became a documentary, became a movie, I think, with Ingrid Bergen years ago. But she, she said the first day they were in the mountains, there was torrential rain, and she said, I just knew I was going to die. I knew I was leading these kids to their death. I was in such despair. I wept through the night. In the morning, one of the 13-year-old girls came over near me, and she said, Mother Gladys, why are you weeping? And she, she said to her, she said, don't you remember Moses led the children through the Red Sea. And Gladys said, I looked that teenager in the eyes and said, but I'm no Moses. And she said, yeah, but God's still God. See, it's God's power at work in us. That's what Paul used to think, that I can do all things. But later, he's a Pharisee. I know the Bible better than anybody. But he found out I can only do all things through Christ, who strengthens me. And what Moses found is that God was relational. God came down in the burning bush, right? And that's why Paul later would refer to Deuteronomy with Moses said, look, he says, don't say in your heart who will ascend uh, or who will descend. But what does it say? This was Moses. And it's one of his last things he ever said. The word, the word of God, the presence of God is near you. It's on your lips and it's in your heart. And that is Paul said the faith we proclaim. Here's the thing you want to know. Moses found out he could have a relationship with God. But God is always the one who initiates that relationship. See, Jesus Christ didn't say, I'm here to teach you how to find God. I'm God, come to find you. And Moses, how did he even speak to God? Because in the Hebrew God, if you looked at God, you would die. But it's very interesting. If you read that call story again that the angels read, uh, what it says is that the angel of the Lord spoke from the bush. See, the angel of the Lord is this cryptic figure in the Old Testament. Sometimes the, it's not a regular angel. It's not a Gabriel. It's not a Michael. It's the angel of the Lord. And sometimes the angel of the Lord speaks for God. And sometimes the angel of the Lord, like here, speaks as God. And what one biblical scholar said that this angel of the Lord is a cryptic manifestation of the second person of the Trinity in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ. Jesus gives us full access to God. He shows us that God has a name and a face. We have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and full of truth. And Moses is just getting the trailer to the movie that's already being made. That we don't have to go up. We don't have to descend. God comes down. He comes to where we are, right? And he calls us like we wouldn't even know God without the calling. When, what did Jesus say when he showed up? He told us our, his mission. His mission, he said, is I come to seek and save the lost. What was lost? <laughs> Just me. Okay, I get it. Um, one person in the back. Good. It was you and I. For us, did Jesus Christ come to the earth? No. For all of humanity, we were lost. Have you ever lost a child? I told a story. I lost my middle son at a water park at Cedar Point for like 20 minutes. I thought I was going to die. You know, I mean, it was horrible. And what happens when you lose something, even if you lose your dog, what do you do? You call their name. You call out to them. When humanity got lost, the story of the Garden of Eden, and we tried to be our own Savior and Lord, what happens? It says, brothers and uh, 
no, it says this one. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, but the Lord God did what? Called. Where are you? God is always the initiator of the relationship, and we wouldn't know God without our calling. So what are the characteristics of the call? I'm going to flash forward to you here in like 12, 14 minutes. And I want you to start seeing the pattern of God's calling is always the same. Moses had something come into his life that disrupted his framework. See, God doesn't come into our lives to be the help. One of the problems is when Moses first saw it, he thought he was initiating things. Let me go see, right? And I hear people talk about, yeah, we're searching for God as though they're the ones initiating it. But what they're really doing when they say, I'm searching for God, I'm searching for an experience of God that will come in and help me with the rough edges of my life, right? It's a God that I can control either by being totally obedient and then God owes me or just believe, well, God is Santa Claus and he'll give me all the toys no matter what I say or do. And we're really pursuing a God that we can control. But Moses turned aside. He saw something that he'd never seen before. It challenged his framework. It challenged his understanding. There's a book I had to read back in college. It's still out there in college print. Um, I'm not a science guy, but the book, I don't know if you ever heard of Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. He was the head of philosophy department at MIT. And it's been in its 50th anniversary pre- uh, teaching. It's still taught in med schools and in science astronomy and in philosophy and others. And what he said in that book is science does not change because of facts. Because he said human beings don't handle facts well. Have you noticed that? In our world, you know, you can get one saying one, one, and and it's totally true. What he said was revolutionary, that facts come in to us, and we basically evaluate them based on our frameworks and our worldviews. And so we tend to take the fact and, you know, weave it so it supports what we believe. And the classic example was when, you know, the ancients, or not that long ago, Uh, in world history, believed that the earth was the center of the universe, right? So you could look up in the skies, and there was a fact. The stars were moving, the moon was moving, the sun was moving. And so you fit that fact into your framework. Oh, this is supporting that the earth is the center of the universe. Isn't it interesting that we thought we were the center of the universe? I just, just a little sidebar there. No wonder God is still calling us. But all of a sudden... Science, scientists looked at other things and they introduced the fact that we think the sun is the center of the solar system. And we're revolving around the sun. It's not revolving around us. And what happened is that fact came in and it came into the framework of what they personally thought and believed and their framework couldn't support the evidence of the fact. So the framework collapsed. Have you ever had that happen? I had... That's a burning bush. That's new information that you didn't know that now comes in and your little things you understood don't support it and it collapses and you turn aside to see something new and you discover God's in it. I had somebody recently, um, I got permission for this, started to um, attend our church online and reached out to me, and I started talking to them, and they said, look, I, I was not into church. I wasn't into Christians. I thought you guys are all mean, judgmental, uh, hate people. He said, but I, remember, I met a member of your church, and, and they, I work with them, and I was blown away because this is a person that's a Christian who actually is open-minded. I never knew there was such a thing. More open-minded than I am, extremely loving, more loving than I am, very non-judgmental, less judgmental than me. And it caused me to go, hmm, so I've been worshiped with me online. What happened? A burning bush, new information came in and the framework of what they believed. Now, there's good reason to believe that, the way Christians are behaving. But meeting that changed, crushed the worldview and it causes a burning bush. But you turn aside. So if something is making you turn aside, if something's getting your, your attention, and it can be different things. 
It can be something very, very volatile. It can be a disease, a tragedy. It can be something very mild, an open-minded person, a sermon, words of a song. But if it makes you turn aside and you're seeing something new, pay attention. It could be God's new call or new claim on your life. I could preach on that for the end of the sermon. I won't. Turns aside. And when, when he finds out that God's in it, God says what? Take off your shoes. Two very interesting things in this. Take off your sandals, actually. But in that day and age, you only took off your sandals when you went into somebody's tent because the furs would be down and your feet would be safe. So the first thing God's saying is, Moses, you're safe with me. But the thing, second thing he's saying is, Moses, you can't control me. I'm not going to fit into your shoes. You're going to have to fit into my direction. See, we think we're going to God for a little bit of help. I just need a personal assistant to get me through the hard times. And God says, I'm not here to be your personal assistant. I'm here to be your Lord. I'm the Lord of the universe. And see, all of a sudden, a recognition of God, you go, my gosh, behind everything, there is a God. And this God is not tame. You can't domesticate this God. This God doesn't work for you. You work for him. This God created you. This, this God has visions and dreams for you. And Moses had to find out this, this is a God. And he even tried to play the trick because if you, if you knew God's name in that day and age, I'm praying in the name of Mars. I'm praying in the name of Isis. Anytime you knew God's name, you can control that God. You remember Moses even tried that one? Well, what's your name? I am what I am. I will be what I will be. What do you think I am? Today I'm a burning bush. Go out and work on your burning bush sermon. Tomorrow I'll be a, be a pillar of smoke by day. And just when you get your smoke sermon together, I'll be a pillar of fire by night. And when you start preaching about the fire, I'll be a stick that turns the bitter water sweet. And you get your stick sermon all figured out, I'll be water from a rock. And when you think, okay, I got the water sermon, I'll part the waters in front of your eyes. Anything you think I am, I'm more. I'm being itself. I'm life itself. I'm the one behind all the others. I, I'm what you need me to be when you need me to be it. Moses, I don't play those games. You don't control me. Quit trying to do it. Quit trying to cut me down into your shoes and into your size. I am what I am. Take off your shoes. Have you turned aside? Have you taken off your shoes? Have you fallen down on your face? And then the third thing, and this is the, the main thing, <clears throat> God calls us in to do what? Send us out. Do you ever notice that? All throughout the scriptures we'll see this. God calls us in to know God personally and collectively and that God is with us and for us. And then God says, now go. I have work for you to do. You thought I was coming in to help you with the goals for your life. I don't care about your goals for your life. I care about my goals for your life. You have been created in the image of God, right? You, for by God's grace, you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift, not by works, so that anybody could boast. Because you're God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We weren't saved by good works, but we were created for good works. To help create the kingdom of God. Do you realize... This is your purpose. This is your mission. This is your calling. If you don't have a calling in your life that's bigger than you, if you don't have a calling bigger than your own comfort or your own security, then you have nothing that's really worth living for and certainly nothing worth dying for. God says, I have a calling that's a whole new agenda for your life. It's a part of you being part of not just yours, me being part of your story, but you're being part of my story, and I've got purpose, I've got significance, I have a calling, God help us, if we never have a calling bigger than ourselves. I had a little sign I kept on my desk that said, you know, um, unless you look up, you'll always think you're the highest point. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence does my help and my calling come? It calls from the Lord who made heaven and earth. This is the foundation we need in a world gone mad. This is your yes, this is your why. This is what God has called you for. 
And it doesn't mean, anytime I talk about this, people say, oh, yeah, I got to go into ministry. You're already in ministry. God has equipped all for ministry. We're God's missionaries. We're God's ambassadors. Read the scripture. We're, we're, we're reconcilers. This is who we are in a world. But the only way we can do it is stay connected to the foundation, right? I, I use this image to stay connected to our trellis. You ever seen trellises, right? If you're gardeners or, or you know, I think that, you know, florists, you need trellises, right? I had a woman I, I heard in a podcast this week who wrote books about soul care that said the only way we're going to thrive in our spiritual life is we got to take the flashlight and look under the foundation of the bridges in our lives and see where the fractures are and, and see where the things that need attention and what's God challenging with me and what's God calling me to dip because if we don't have a trellis, if we don't have a foundation, see, the, the vines and the, and, the, and the flora and the fauna, they can't blossom, they can't flower without a firm foundation. And she said, we are living beings too, and we need, our souls need something to grow our lives around. And it's a call, it's a calling, it's the purposes of God. So Moses, now go, now go. Some of us have been called in. We just haven't had the courage to go, right? We need others to go with us. So God says to, you know, teaches Moses, okay, I'm not sending you out alone. Do you notice Jesus never sends anybody out alone? He always sends them out in pairs and community. In the first stage of spiritual growth, if you read it, one of the worst things you can do as you're coming into an awareness of your calling and of God is be in isolation. The devil does his best work when he gets you alone. Right? And, and so Moses, you know, when he says, can you send somebody else? What happened? God got angry. But God is patient with us. God, God's not harsh. Right? It says the harshness of God is softer than the, soft, the softest heart of any human heart. You know, he says, okay, Moses, I'm, I'm not liking what you're saying here. But how about I make you part of a team? I don't want you to go it alone. And so when God calls us, you're going to sense this. He'll, he'll get your attention to turn aside. He'll tell you, take off your shoes. Quit trying to put me in a box. I'm God all by myself, right? C.S. Lewis said, you don't have to prove God. He's a lion. Just unlock the cage, right? And, and, and go and discover your purpose and mission, the calling I have on your life, and don't go it alone. I'm going to send people around you. I'm going to send friends, and I'm going to send advisors, and maybe a preacher that gets your attention once in a while, and, and, and I want to call you into community of others. And some of you, God's been calling and calling and calling, and, and you've come, you've, you've listened to them, but this is the part you're afraid to do, to go. I don't know if you were here last Sunday for Baptism Sunday. I wrote about this in my e-note. I had a moment, man. I have a new kindred spirit. Alex Cortez, you know, he shared his testimony. He's been a member of this church for 14 years. He said, I made a commitment 14 years ago to be baptized. You remember his story if you were here? And he said, I want to do it with one of my family members as, as I'm being a model. And so Alex was baptized to be baptized together with his four-year-old grandson, Caden. I don't know if you remember, Alex came in, we had a moment, we'd been together, and Alex was laid back in the water, and then Akil was helping me in the pool, he got out so Alex could assist me with Caden, and Caden went up in our first step and looked at that water, and he was not having it. <laughs> he would not, he was screaming, he was clinging to his mom, and I was saying to Alex, you know, I, I can sprinkle him, I can put him on, no, no, we need, they're coaxing him to come in, and I took the mic if you were here, and I said, this is exactly how I came to God. It really was. It was absolutely autobiographical. When I was called to ministry, um, and I, I, I was like, okay, God, I'll go preach. But, oh, my God, do I have to join a church? I got to be with those folk? Like, please. And I was kicking and screaming. In fact, true story. I'm, going, I'm sorry. I'm a little past my time. I had so many signs to be in ministry. And I finally told Terry, okay, we're going to do this. And I was going to put our business up for sale. And I was at my mom's house, house sitting, and she had all these woods and property next to her. And I got mad at God, and I said, okay, you got to give me another sign. I need a burning bush. And I literally went out there. I was 27, 28 years old. And I climbed a tree, like 20 foot in the air. And I sat on this branch, and I said, unless you show me, I'm not going. I mean, he had, he had been pouring out signs. 
He's so patient with me. And I'm, I'm just obstinate, obstinate. I'm not going, I'm not going, you know. And then my butt started to hurt. You know, you're sitting on this little tree and I'm getting uncomfortable. And I'm like, God, hurry up and all this. And, and I just had this thought, like, would you really be 20 feet up in the air in a branch in a tree if you didn't have me already? <laughs> and I climbed back down the tree. And I was, I was thinking with Caden, and I know what that's like to be afraid, but our God is not harsh. Our God is patient. He'll send companions. He said, I'll give you the words to speak. I'll be with your heart. I'll be with you all the way. I'll give you a staff of my presence. And little Caden finally came in the water, and he was still crying, and we put him underneath, and we picked him up, and he was cheering. And I said, my God, that's how it goes. You need a trellis in your life. You need a foundation. It's scary. This is it. Moses found out it was it. And at the end of his 120 years, his vision had not, you know, been impaired, and his vigor had not been abated. Uh, Gladys, that missionary I told you about, I'm going to invite you to come to this table, and maybe for some of you, this is a turn-aside moment today. Maybe it could be a burning bush. Maybe this message could be. They asked Gladys how she got through those trials and rescued all those hundred orphans and everything, and she said, when I gave my life to God, I just said a little prayer. Here was her prayer. She said, oh, God, here's my Bible. Here's my money. Here's me. Use me, oh, Lord. As you come to the table today, say, God, here's what I have. Here's who I am. I wish you'd pick somebody else, but here's me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Pastor Terry, we